All right, so we're going to do the lecture portion for session nine. We're looking at uh, the church planter characteristics. Okay. So I'm going to be going back and forth between the podium and the board so I can draw on it in cool color. So uh, cool. this is the last, you know, we do everything in quarters, so we have uh, sections of three. This is the last or the third on the church planter. And so the next, uh, next section, the next three, which has to be the last three sessions. We have like two weeks of you guys just working on your final project in class and working on that stuff. So Wait, the last the two weeks is, yeah, your Chan or Smith project. Oh, so yeah. I, have like, I think I have, if you check the syllabus schedule, I have like two or three class periods that we just work on that. So she should give you plenty of time to do that and review for your final exam, which, as you can tell, is probably going to be easy. You also have a final exam this weekend. Uh, I think I have it due Saturday, but you know how I like to slip up and have things due like on a Monday, so you might have an extra day or two um, for that. And the calling video, uh, you'll be uploading that on Saturday as well. So, so let's jump into the church planter. We talked about, uh, what was the first one with Pastor Will? We talked about the church planter's call. Call, okay. Last week we talked about the church planter's character, characteristics. Uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. That means this is a typo, and we'll fix it now. Do it. So this should be not characteristics. I'll tell you, I'm, I am a week off for whatever reason. It should be. I'm going to do green. Capabilities. Green is the color of boogers. Money. Okay, How so the church planter capability, that's completely my fault again. I haven't had a lot of sleep lately. My PhD classes have started back again. Mm -hmm. And so I'm getting up exorbitantly early and staying up really late. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, that was another goof by me. So we're talking about the church planter's capabilities, okay? How a person, uh, we talked about kind of, you know, we talked about the idea of being wired for church planning. The, you know, what's, what's the, uh, are you called to do it, first of all? We know we're called to make disciples primarily, but you may be doing that in a church planting role or setting. Um, we talked about characteristics. So in that, we talked about, um, you know, we looked at some of those lists of the, the kind of characteristics of a church planter that, you know, some of the different blog posts. Uh, we discussed um, some of the spiritual ideas from, uh, was it 1 Timothy 3 and Titus? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the, the um, qualifications, qualifications of an elder, uh, which I would say the qualification of every um, Christian. It should be characteristics of every Christian, but the elders that lead guys. So uh, today, uh, today's, I guess last you're going to look a little bit more at um, kind of the role of the, the elder or pastor, uh, but because we do believe that church planning is not just done by a male elder or pastor, it's done by God's people, uh, we will discuss throughout how other roles play into it. So talking about capabilities, you can also say skills, what are the skills required to plant a church. And so today's going to be a little more of a practical thing. We'll look at some of the more spiritual elements first, and then at the end of it, we're going to look at some of the very practical things. Um, you know me, I like to bring bring books to class. So we've got a few books that we want to discuss as we go and um, kind of highlight. You're reading this week in Stetzer Chapter 4. Uh, you'll notice uh, the very, I think the first three things we look at are uh, basically kind of outlined and he explains a lot more in depth in his book. I adapted his and uh, from the two other sources that I used, kind of put these things together for the ca uh, capabilities of a planter. So you kind of get a mix of different perspectives uh, on what it looks like. So we're, we're talking about capabilities. Let me erase this. So uh, yeah. All right. So let's ask this question: What is a church planter? All right. This is taken from the uh, Redeemer Church manual. Let me get up a little bit more. There we go. Uh, what is a church planter? Is a Christian leader. Uh, this is a quote, a Christian leader leads from character before skill. Now today we're talking about skill, um, but actually we can talk about character, right? Character is far more important than skills in Christian leadership. Okay? Now this is in Redeemer Church, uh, Tim Keller, Pastor yeah. Tim Keller's his, uh, church. They have a thick manual, I got it in my office, and um, in their section on assessment and the church planter himself, uh, this is one of the quotes they actually start with. A Christian leader leads from character before skill. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the skills, but at the end of the day, here's what I want you to understand is that just because you may not fit some of the personality profiles or may have all the gifting, it doesn't mean you just give up and church planning is not going to be what you do vocationally. That's, that's not what this means. Uh, some of the data we're going to look at is basically from some studies 
is you know it'll say 75% of church planters seem to be characterized this way. But the other 25% can still have very healthy growing churches. It doesn't mean they're failures. It just means the majority are kind of wired in a certain way. And you'll probably notice that yourself. You'll probably pick up on some characteristics as we go. Um, so character is far more important than skills in Christian leadership. Why? I mean, the, you see, who, who did Jesus call for his 12 disciples? Character. The unqualified people. I mean, they, they didn't have any skill, really, to, they were fishermen. How could they go lead a, a movement that in Acts, uh, what, Acts 17, flipped the world upside down? Mm-hmm. How could they do that uh, without skills? Well, he developed their character. Um, and then they learned skills as they went. Kelly, just uh, if you if you can see this okay on the screen, I want to make sure you can see this. Just give me a little thumbs up or type in okay so I hear it. All right, sounds good. I'm gonna take that as a yes. All right, perfect, perfect. I want to make sure you see it. And take take good notes as you go as well. Um, I'll have this PDF along with the others for your to say for your exam like I usually do. I'll have those uh, sent out through Blackboard probably tomorrow. All right, so uh, next question, what is a church planner? Same, same, uh, same question. This is from J.D. Payne's book, Discovering Church Planting. We've highlighted that uh, here before. Um, a church planter, he says, a biblical church planter is one who is sent to preach the gospel, establish churches through disciple making uh, from the harvest fields. Okay. Now remember, we also got our definition for what is church planting from uh, J.D. Payne. And what was our definition from what, the first week that we looked at? Making disciples who then reproduce disciples that lead to new churches planted. All right. That's the ba- basic gist is exactly what you just said. is disciple making that leads to new churches started. All right. So out of that definition, uh, J.D. Payne says a church planter, the person is one who is sent... Okay, so we talked about the idea of being sent uh, in the Mission of God section of this class. So one who was sent, this reminds us of the Missio Dei. All right. It also reminds us, out of the Missio Dei, reminds us what our mission is, which is to preach the gospel All right. and establish churches. This is what we would say is you know, church planting, establishing new churches through what? Making disciples. Okay. So making disciples, that's why we built this foundation. Making disciples is the, the found, that foundational element to, uh, to uh, uh, planting a church. And what does it mean from the harvest? From the world. Yeah, lost people. Yeah. All right, so the harvest is basically we're taking people who do not know Christ, helping them understand the gospel, they are converting, repenting of their sin, believing in faith, and uh, so now they are no longer the harvest, they are part of uh, the church. This definition will most likely be on the exam, just FYI. Okay? Like I said, I will have this sent to you as well as a PDF. All right, so now let's talk about the three kinds of church planters. All right, this is a combination of a couple of different books, uh, but essentially there are three basic kinds. There's the apostolic missionary church planter. There's the missional pastor. And then there's a team planter, okay, or just team planting uh, can be phrased that as well. So let's look at each of these individually. So they're, they're still going to come up if you're still typing. That's fine. Let's look first at the apostolic missionary, Okay. An apostolic missionary, they start churches, raise up leaders from the harvest, okay, and then they move to a new church. Uh, we see this uh, in the example of the Apostle Paul. He would go and he would spend a few months, maybe a couple years at a certain city. He would disciple. He would uh, train some leaders. And then what's happened? He's off to a new city. Right? His whole, you know, mis- the missionary journeys of Paul in the book of Acts, he's hopping from city to city to city. But then he goes back and does what? checks up on him. Yeah, he checks up on him. He sends him letters. He, he visits, sends some of his people maybe to check on them as well. All right, so an apostolic missionary, we here in North, this is a North American church planning class, so we're kind of framing it in our context and how we understand it, okay? We, we usually see the apostolic missionary church planter more in international settings. It's usually what we, we think of when, when uh, maybe our mission board has a, a person who does go overseas, you know, along with a team, and then they go from you know, one village or city to the next, and they plant, 
raise up leaders from the harvest and, and indigenous leaders, and then they train them, get them developed, and then once they are in a healthy state, that person moves to the, the missionary moves to a, a neighboring village or a neighboring town or you know whichever, and then they're also sending some of these indigenous leaders as missionaries uh, as well. And so when we think of a church planter, uh, you know we here in North America, what are some of the people here in North America that we think of when we think of a church planter? Just name off some of the names of some of the known guys. Driscoll. Okay, like a Mark Driscoll. Right? He planted a church in Seattle, pastored it for 18, was it 18 years until it folded? Okay. Uh, who's, who's someone else? Um, Darren Patrick. Darren Patrick. Same thing in St. Louis, the Journey Church. Huh? He planted it. He's been there for over a decade. Okay. Bill Hybels. And, uh, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, some of those. Yeah. So we think of a church planter that way, but in international mission settings, uh, that's usually not the case. And there may be some when that, when that happens, but usually in an international setting, we have more of the apostolic idea. Um, and Kelly, I'm sure you would agree as well. Let me pull up what Kelly is saying. Yes, Kelly, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask you how long you think the time frame is for, um, for, an, for this type of missionary. How long do they, are they usually at the church before they move on? I, I think it varies with each context. I think if you're if you're there and it takes you five to five or six years to raise up uh, a leader to actually pastor and do that because it's just a really tough soil environment, then you could be there for several years. Um, if you uh, we've seen some of the um, uh, in India and other places in Southeast Asia through the International Mission Board, there are guys who are really only in a village for about nine to twelve months, and then they're ready to go to the next because they. Uh, it was just had a really fruitful harvest, a lot of guys, and they were raising up, and then they've got networks of leaders now they're training. I have a friend who was in India right now who is helping train the pastors who took over from the missionary. And so I really think it varies um, with, each, uh, with each context and each, uh, each mission setting. So um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Too bad. Okay. I can't really give a, a hard time frame, but... Um, and I, I think we need to have a little bit more of an apostolic mindset here in North America. I believe uh, we actually need a little bit of combination of this one and the next. But um, you know, we, we really don't hear of, of guys here in the U.S. especially planting a church and then with two years saying, okay, it's yours, I'm gone. Okay? Uh, my own pastor, uh, Will Plitt, he did something very similar when, when, we plant, when he planted 121. He was kind of the lead church planter. He was here for about four or five years. There was another guy who he was investing in, was an elder, and my pastor went to Raleigh to help plant a new church and left this guy to, to lead it. And he led it for about another five years. And then Pastor Will came back uh, because he was moving back to the Winston-Salem area. He came back and, and took over as pastor. He's not the church planter anymore, the founding pastor. Well, he still is the founding pastor. Um, so we, we don't see this a lot, though. We usually see a little bit more idea. Um, so here's the apostolic missionary, starts new churches, raises up leaders from the harvest, then moves to a new church. Yeah, Kelly, go ahead. Do you think that there are certain like people or pastors that are prepared to um, plant a church like, like this, like start a church, raise up leaders, and then go, and that basically they're prepared to do that, to go around planting churches, and, and are they equally prepared to be able to pastor a church for a long amount of time, or should that be a different person with a different calling? Because like the people you were talking about, they said they were a church planner and they church planned it, and then they just stayed for a long time. Right. And so are they, you know, what is that what they're supposed to be doing, or is it like a separate calling, or what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me get to the second one. I think that might actually explain your, your question a good bit more uh, fully. Because um, we're looking at the three kinds, so I, I would say that all three of these kinds are really involved in planting and can be considered a church planter. Some, I would say a church planter is one who is more the apostolic idea here, that they are planting and they're going from place to place, starting a new work, uh, turning it over, moving on. But a missional pastor, I would say they're a church planter for just a season. Okay? I would say a missional pastor is one who starts a church, so they kind of act as a planter at the beginning. They you know, in all, in all the areas that we think of a church plan, they're understanding their context, they're raising up a team, they're securing funds, or you know, whichever it is, all those kind of pre-things, they're helping start a new church, but only for a short time are they actually functioning as a church planter. Um, because a missional pastor usually remains long-term to pastor the new church. This is the predominant uh, model used in North America. 
I'm not saying it's right, um, but I think God, um, you know, can use both the missional pastor and apostolic missionary in different settings. Because a lot of times the missional pastors who start these churches, in many cases, and especially uh, you know, more in more uh, recent decades here in North America, they become church planting churches. Okay, uh, so you mentioned uh, Darren Patrick a while ago. You know, his church has helped plant dozens of other churches, mm-hmm. both in St. Louis, uh, across the United States, and across the world. And so would we say that they aren't involved in church planting? Well, no, they are. They're very much involved in church planting. Mm-hmm. Um, here's some examples. Uh, Rick Warren. Uh, both I've, I've heard on, on different video things years ago, or maybe in books, but both Rick Warren and Darren Patrick both said that they prayed, God, let me, help me start a church, and let me stay there the rest of my life and pastor it. They prayed for that. They loved the city they were in. And then, you know, so Rick Warren has been at his church for, I think, almost 30 years yeah. now. It's been close to that. I think Darren Patrick is close to 15 or so years, maybe give or take a little bit. Um, like a Tim Keller went up to New York City and planted Redeemer Church, and they have uh, a network, and they've planted hundreds of churches across the globe. Uh, I get their uh, monthly newsletter emails, and they're always highlighting a planter in Tokyo, New Delhi, uh, London, different places. And so um, these are, you know, you see more of these in a North American setting. Um, and so, like I said, Neither of these are, are better than the other. Uh, kind of like uh, going with uh, Kelly's question, I think some are better wired to be this way. And so if you're, you know, you're here in the U.S. and you are really just kind of, you think you're wired to be a pastor, but you kind of see a need for a new church, you might have more of this missional pastor posture where you are functioning as a church planter in that kind of mindset. Because in a, just like in an international setting, you're still trying to raise up leaders. Now, indigenous leaders means people from your community, not so much a, a different ethnicity, like in your, you're in a, a, you know, a, a, a place overseas, so to speak. Uh, but you're still trying to raise up from your congregation people who can lead. And possibly it, it, could come, it could come to where you do have someone who does take over your church and you do move on after 15, 20 years of pastoring. You kind of get that itch again to go and plant, and so you go plant a second church. I mean, there, there's, you know, all those have been done, and uh, neither one of them are right or wrong. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with experience. Um, for, for me personally, um, um, I, I kind of want to be a mix of these, to be honest. I kind of want to have that apostolic to where I am willing to go after three or four years and let someone who I've raised up to, to take over. But then again, if God is, if, if, I'm, if I'm in a place and, uh, you know, our church is able to, you know, we're, we're helping plant two or three new churches a year, and, and part of my wiring is actually helping to see that happen. If, and if I were to leave, that may not happen as well because someone is not ready to kind of take over that reign of leadership in that particular capacity, then it might be more beneficial to God's kingdom that I stay there and be that more missional pastor. Um, I think being open to be the one and letting God completely wreck your world. Um, we, we mentioned a Rick Warner, Darren Patrick, you know, I would say those guys probably, if God, you know, is really laying on their heart to go to a different place and plant, they'd probably, they would probably do it. Even though they prayed and asked, if God said, you know, I got a different plan, I don't think they'd say, okay, God, can't do that. Um, I think, uh, I think you would see those guys uh, leave and go do that. So uh, let's look at a third model, which um, probably not discussed as much as a kind of a church planter, but I did want to highlight it, and, and Stetzer does highlight it in the chapter that you read for this week about team planting. Okay. So in team planting, it's a group of disciple makers who relocate to an area to start a new church. Okay. And sometimes they may or may not have that kind of lead church planting pastor guy with them. It may just be a group of Christians who get together and start having a Bible study somewhere, or they have a burden for a particular side of town. They all move into that community. Uh, I have a friend right now who is in High Point, and he and three other families move to a specific neighborhood to uh, start basically a, a, a house church. And they're just seeking ways to love that community that they all moved into from a different city. Um, but he does not consider himself the lead pastor of that, of that group. It's very organic. It's very house church feel. Um, and they are trying to multiply um, their uh, house church. So we would see these as examples in some of the missional community ideas of churches. Because in those, the leadership is kind of decentralized. Uh, house churches or simple churches often function in this kind of a mindset. You have a, 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 fam, a couple of families or uh, a group of people, and they, multi- they actually plant a church in their home, and then they multiply. A um, friend of mine uh, in uh, Kentucky, he is uh, the part of the Simple Church Alliance. Uh, his name is Gavin Durson, and um, he, um, at a, he was a, a, at a, actually, well, uh, kind of a mega church, about nine, 900,000 people, member church. He was an assistant pastor, um, and to really felt 
burden to plant house churches. And so he, the, the church blessed him, actually funded him for about two years. And, let, and basically he was being paid to plant house churches, but still being paid by this church. They were just a really great church to, to do that. And they now have about a dozen house churches that are in a network, and they get together three or four times a year as a, as a group. They don't have a weekly service because they are house churches. Um, but he has different kind of you know, leader pastors in each of those homes. He pastors th- that group in his home, helps those multiply and trains those guys. Um, so it's very much of a team idea. Um, and so out of that, you may have a church that actually is birthed and becomes more of a, uh, a missional pastor type thing if, that, if those house churches start gathering more often. It, it, could, you know, it could definitely happen. Um, but here in the, in the team planter, I would say that this third one, should really the idea should really permeate both the others. The apostolic, even though you're the, you, you may move from place to place, you should always try to do so in a team. I think team planting is very healthy. Uh, some, some people and families may be wired to parachute plant where they just move to a place, start from scratch. It's just the guy and his wife and two kids. That has been done. I don't think it's the healthiest. Um, you have to be very wired very specifically. I, 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 I can name one guy who I have talked to and spent time with who did it, and it didn't completely flop. But he said it was the toughest thing in his life he ever did, and he wouldn't do it again. Um, he would he would actually have a team go. He was he's in New Orleans right now, oh. um, but he, he told me in the Skype interview he's like, no, I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> so that was kind of dumb, but uh, that's what God laid on his heart at the time, I guess. So, um, but I think you see these in both international North American settings, and they kind of pair with the first two. So, um, apostolic missionary planter, missional pastor, and then also a team planter. Any questions about these three? Mm-hmm. And Stetzer does cover each of those three in the uh, in the book. Okay, so I went a little bit too far. All right, let's look at Apest, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, popular verse. You know, it's Christ gave the church his, uh, his body, certain kind of uh, people gifted in a certain way. So uh, the verses say he, he gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. So you can see how we get the idea of Apest coming from, uh, let me get out of the way. You, oh no! Oh no! You gotta fix that red line at the top. Okay, so there's there's the apes, all right. So apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Now, uh, the the point of that verse is Christ gives these two two local churches these these people in order to do what? <coughs> to equip the people for ministry, right? So he gives the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd, teachers. Now. I would say if you're a part of a, a team church plant, you know, you would, you know, each of us are probably a combination of, of a few of these. Um, I would doubt that any of us do these all very well, though we probably all have a little bit, um, if you're in a church planting program, you probably have a little bit of an apostolic nature. Um, now, we don't talk about, you know, the actual apostles from the Bible in that sense. Uh, you know, I don't believe we still have necessarily the office of apostle. I think we have the characteristics um, of an apostle in uh, the idea that is one who is sent to establish. Uh, we, a lot of church planters kind of see themselves in these apostolic roles where they're going to a new area to do something. Uh, so very, you know, Paul was an apostle who went from place to place to place. Uh, prophet, he's the one who knows the direction. He's the, the vision caster. He is, um, you know, the here's where we're going and here's who I need to come with me. Okay, so this could be part of the, the gift mix that um, you know, God gives you and the team that you're putting together. Now, this does not mean that every single one of these, you, you don't have an apostle, uh, a pastor of apostleship, a pastor who's a prophet, a pastor who's an evangelist. Pa- you know, that's not what this means. It means that uh, God gives both pastors and the laity in your church these kind of gifting. These kind of people will characterize those who are in your church. So the evangelist, they're the one who champion the cause. All right. Now, the evangelist is also the one who is sharing the gospel, but that's kind of the idea of championing the cause. They're always talking about what this new church is doing. All right, they're the proclaiming the evangelist. They're spreading this good news, and they're always talking about what God is doing uh, uh, through the gospel for people's lives. So that evangelist has that kind of different mentality. They're really good at relating with people and uh, bringing them into the body as well. The shepherd, he's that person, or he or she is that person who is caring for God's people, uh, and that kind of shepherding uh, the flock kind of mentality. Um, and then the teacher, one who's clarifying the truth. Okay, so a teacher uh, takes God's word, maybe in a preaching setting or a one-on-one discipleship or small group setting, and is one who is really clarifying the truth. Um, 
uh, in our uh, gospel community, uh, as part of my church, there's you know about eight or ten of us. You know, we're starting to now as we're starting to, to kind of form as a group. We're starting to understand who is the stronger apostle of the group and who's the stronger shepherd. Okay, I can tell you, I'm not the strong shepherd. My wife is a better shepherd because she's really caring for the people. Uh, she is, is texting some of the other girls, you know, more often than I'm texting guys, just to check on them, check up on them, make sure they're okay. Um, I'm, right now, I'm functioning a, a lot more as the apostle, prophet, and teacher. Okay, but we have several of our students and people who are in a group who are more of our evangelists. They, there have been others who have brought more friends to some of the dinners we've done and invited more law people than I have. So we're, we're identifying who those are. We want to maximize those, um, and also see, okay, you may you probably a mix of these. Um, so this comes from Alan Hirsch. Uh, his book, uh, The Shaping of Things to Come, I'll put it up here close to the, uh, the camera. You know, it's going to be backwards, I'm sorry. This is The Shaping of Things to Come. Uh, he talks about it. Uh, this is his uh, first book that really kind of got some of his ideas. And he has another book, which is called The Forgotten Ways, which he also expounds the APES idea. And this has a chapter on it. The Forgotten Ways is, has like a, a big section. It's like five chapters on it. So that's also a good book. Uh, I got it on, on, on uh, Kindle. So, uh, so let's uh, move to the next. Any questions about APEST? Kind of the, the wide mirror. We're talking about skills and abilities. Yes, Kelly, go ahead. Um, can someone have more than one of the characteristics? Yeah, I, I would say that um, uh, we all probably have a, a little bit of each. Um, you know, I would say that uh, right now, um, I always thought that I was more of the uh, prophet teacher, uh, was kind of more my role. But in the gospel community that I'm helping lead now, I'm functioning a lot more, more a lot more as an apostle because I help start the new group. Um, and so I would say yes, we do have uh, each person probably is a mix of these kind of like with spiritual gifts. That we're going to look at next. Uh, a person is probably a mix of these, uh, but a certain one or two probably shine a little bit more than the others or you're a little bit more gifted in. Um, I'm not the most gifted evangelist, to be honest, and I'm not the most gifted uh, shepherd. Um, that's just not, you know, if you talk to my pastor, he is super high on apostle and prophet, super low on shepherding. Uh, it's really kind of funny. He's like, I'm a pastor, which means to shepherd, you know, he's like, but I stink at it. Yeah. Um, but we have other two, the two other elders in our church function. We have one, uh, Pastor Mark. He is the shepherd bar none. I mean, he is always taking care of the leaders, the people. Uh, anytime there's an issue, Pastor Will is like, right, Mark, this is yours. You go handle it. So I um, hope that answers your question, Kelly. But yes, I do, I do think we would, uh, each person does have a mix. Kind of like here with spiritual gifting. Uh, this is uh, just a, a, a general list. You can find this, uh, you know, study the, the various passages in Romans and uh, Corinthians uh, to get the spiritual gifting. Um, but administration, apostolate, discernment, Evangelism, exhortation, faith, giving, healing, interpretation in, in tongues. Uh, of course, we at Piedmont believe that uh, that has ceased, not really done. Um, but I'm not going to stop a person who has you know, missionaries who have told me who I trust who have said, you know what, um, I've seen it happen. I think God can still use it. I just don't think it's uh, done quite the same way. It's always a known language. Here in, here in North America, our churches, our charismatic churches, have their own like Holy Spirit language that they do, and then they have an interpreter. I think it's hogwash because everywhere in the Bible tongues is mentioned, it was a literal language understood by other people, not by just your one interpreter. Uh, there are actually Christian universities uh, uh, here in the States who have classes on speaking in tongues and interpreting in tongues, but they're not in a language. It's not Spanish, it's not German, it's not Swahili. It's, here's, here's the words to make up. That's exactly what they teach. Uh, kind of I talked to a student, it's, it's really ironic. But anyways, so we're gonna kind of let that one hang at the bottom a little bit. That'd be interesting. Um, cool. But knowledge, leadership, mercy, miracles, we would say that we believe God does do miracles, um, but we're not quite the Benny Hinn type. All right. Uh, Pastor Shepherd, uh, another spiritual gift, prophecy, serving, teaching, wisdom. Now you see the, the six I have in red. Uh, these are ones that uh, Aubrey Malfers, who is a, he's written, written extensively on church planting and leadership. Uh, his book, uh, Planting Growing Churches for the 21st Century, was like the standard textbook for church planning for two decades. I mean, if, you're, if you were studying in seminary a church planning class in the 90s or reading about it, you read Malfer's book, okay? And so he highlights this six and says, typically in, in the church planter mentality, especially more that apostolic mentality, you probably see a lot more of these spiritual gifts being highlighted in the person uh, than some of the others. Um, 
there's a, a few online tests you can do that you can actually do a spiritual gifts uh, analysis and um, or you can just kind of study the definitions of them. Uh, I led my youth group through this um, to kind of help our students uh, think through their spiritual gifts, which is really good. I made this little booklet. They kind of studied it. They read the scripture about it. They looked at some of the examples, and then they discussed it with their friends and their parents to say, okay, do you really think I'm, I'm, I'm gifted at uh, giving or exhortation or discernment or not? And so we, I kind of you know, pick, pick your top three or four or five and say, okay, here's kind of what I'm really uh, spiritually gifted at. Um, mine is not administration. I can tell you that right now. Yep. Obviously, I called this the wrong session um, twice, and so you can tell administration is not mine. Um, but I think teaching might be part of mine, uh, prophecy and uh, serving, um, and uh, uh, leadership. Um, I think are some that uh, that I have, and so uh, I don't want to park here for too long. But uh, did want to highlight that these are some of the six that. Aubrey Mathers in his book would say kind of uh, characterize some of the apostolic missionary church planters um, but it doesn't mean if you don't have this particular mix that you can't be involved in it like I said it's more about character than it is about your skills uh, or even gifting um, let's move on to the next we can make sure we get done in 10 minutes um, prophet priest king this is a little bit maybe, might be a little bit different idea for you um, uh, the pastors or, or planters of a church work best together if their gifting and skills are maximized and their roles designated by gifting and calling. So when we talk about prophet, priest, and king, we're talking about their role of uh, more of the pastors. Okay? Uh, they're the laity, probably exhibit some of these functions as well. And you may have some lay people who function in the idea of a prophet, priest, or king and aren't an elder. So a, a, a lady uh, who maybe is uh, serving or leading or whichever, it probably want to function in these as well, even though she may not be an elder. But for this conversation in, in the topic, um, we're going to kind of couch it in the idea of a pastor. Um, and uh, we see that in the Bible, Christ fulfilled the roles of prophet, priest, and king. And I will contend he is the only human who could do so effectively. Okay? So he's ta- talking about prophet, priest, and king. Uh, we're talk, you know, think of I think of my dad when I think about this. Who um, he was the only pastor in a small church, about 100, 120, in a, in a very small town, Hamlet, North Carolina. He pastored that church for about a dozen years, and he was really expected to fulfill all three of these roles. We're going we're to look at what each role uh, means, but uh, in, and he had a heart attack at age 49 mm-hmm. because he was expected to be not only the prophet doing the preaching and the teaching and casting the vision for the church. He was a priest who was visiting, doing all the hospital visits, all the premarital counseling, all the crisis counseling, and he was also the king. He was in charge of all the administration, making things were organized and getting done, and trying to oversee all the committees and teams. That will burn you out if you're doing it alone. So I think a church functions best when they have um, at least three, at least three, hopefully more, uh, uh, elders or pastors or leaders um, who function as prophets, priests, and kings. You can kind of see it almost like in a trinity. They, they, they have different functions, but they work together as a good team. So let's look at these each individually. Uh, this comes from uh, Driscoll and Brashear's book, uh, Vintage Church. As a prophet, Jesus preached and taught scripture with authority and has now commissioned preachers filled with his spirit to proclaim his word, uh, this prophet. As priest, Jesus cares for people and deals with their sin compassionately and causes people to join him in these ministries of mercy. As king, Jesus demonstrated his rule over creation through miracles while on the earth and today leads his people, the spiritual body of Christ, into all nations and cultures through church leaders, principles, and systems by the Holy Spirit according to his word. So we're kind of seeing how Christ did all these and he did them well. We kind of mirror those in our church leadership in a lot of way. But I would contend we don't and are not able to do all of these as effectively as Christ because he was the only human who was absolutely perfect. So let's look at prophet. All right, so when I think of this, I really do think of, uh, and I'm, I know I give the example of my church, but it's because I'm living it, doing it, a part of it, and it makes more sense to me uh, in explaining. But the prophet, this is our pastor, Will. He does most of the teaching and, and preaching, but he is really the vision casting uh, pastor of our church. He knows where we uh, need to go as a body. He, he, he has actually spent the last year and a half uh, kind of refocusing the whole church on its mission of making disciples for Christ's glory in our city. And so he's really kind of leading that. So in the elders' meetings, I've been a part of at least three so far, he's the guy who's at the whiteboard coaching the other elders and leading us through. Uh, he's the, the pastor at the uh, our partner member meeting 
when he is saying, here's where we're going as a church, uh, what questions do you have, and he's guiding our church through that. So that's kind of like that prophet role, teaching and vision casting, okay? So I'm probably going to ask you this on a test, so just know that the prophet serves the role of teaching and vision casting. Then the next part of your leadership team should have a priest, okay? The priest is usually responsible or is really gifted at, and this includes the apest ideas and the spiritual gifts, at counseling and care, okay? So he's the person who sits down in the coffee shop and will give you three hours of his day. Uh, he's the one who, um, when, and that's not says, that's who oh. he sees, sorry, it's a misspelling, so let me correct that as well. Can, can I correct it for you? No, you cannot. Dang. Oh, you want to write on the board, don't I you? I do. Yes, come, come write a big blue E for me, uh, Derek, yes. as I finish explaining. So the priest sees how to take care of the people along the way, Okay. So you have a, a prophet who is saying, oh, we've got this great idea, we're going to plant this church, we're going to do this, and there you go. Thank you, thank you, Dave. You get an A-plus for today. Matt Malin, you get an A-plus-plus. Plus. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry, he just he's closer, so. It's because I've stayed silent, and I haven't <laughs> asked of anything. Okay, you know? you, everyone gets an A-plus-plus plus today, because you're all great students. Okay. A-plus-plus right. plus minus All right, so, Derek. you have your prophet who... <laughs> You have your prophet who says, okay, here's where we need to go as a church. Or he's on the, the church planting team. Here's what we're going to do as a team. Here's where we're moving. Here's, you know, he's kind of overseeing and leading that. The priest comes in and says, well, how are we going to make sure people are cared for? Who's going to make sure that, you know, when we're raising funds and you're asking, you know, these other people to kind of help with that, that they're, they're not stressing out and just going to leave after six months. Okay? Who is taking care of the people themselves? That's that, that's that priest function. That's Pastor Mark. He meets with each gospel community leader once a month. Usually meet him at Panera Bread or Starbucks or somewhere. And he's asked me, how are you doing, Dustin? How, 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 how is leading your gospel community with the Wake Forest group, how is that affecting Jill and your relationship with her? Right? Now, Pastor Will, he may ask me those from time to time, but Pastor Mark is really focused on and how I'm doing and taking care of me so I can take care of others. Okay? And so that priest role really comes out in things like hospital visitation. We've got to understand that a little bit at church, uh, crisis things. That doesn't mean the prophet doesn't do those things. It's just that's not his strength. And having you know someone else alongside you kind of helps alleviate some of that load. Well, uh, so this, yeah, go ahead. Let me ask this question then. So I, I would definitely say that I'm, I'm in the prophet area with the teaching, but I may not be as good at vision casting as I am teaching and I do know that I do have some priest, you know, like like uh, counsel, maybe caring for people, but maybe not so much counseling. Yeah. So, does that? I mean, it, it, it's, it's just like when we looked at an A pass in spiritual gifts. It doesn't mean you're just one. Right. I am high prophet, next priest, low king. So mm -hmm. if, if I do like a, a pie chart, all right. So let's say. For as far as prophet, uh, I'd say this is probably this is probably me as a prophet. And then here, I'm King. more priest. priest. So I do I do try to care. It's not like I'm mean to people or don't care. <laughs> yeah. It's just I'm not the best at sitting down and counseling with them. Yeah. But I, I do it, and I'm trying to get better at it as well. And then I'm probably this much king administration. I need a lot of help when it comes to administrative stuff. Yeah. Okay, um, a lot. And uh, now I've I've learned some things and gotten better because my job here at Piedmont has actually it's it's far more uh, kingly administration than what I prefer, but it has stretched me. I'm learning, um, and my boss has a lot of patience with me as I do learn. Um, and so each person is going to be a little bit different. Um, most likely, that kind of apostolic missionary person is a probably going to be high on the profit scale. Yeah. But they should have alongside them a priest and a king. Or it may be that, you know, okay, Derek, let's say that you and Maddie are kind of, you, you guys are talking about playing a church together, let's Never. say in Charlotte, North no. Carolina. No. Right? No. Now, it may be that you are, there you go, you want to get the name. Derek, it may be that you're high prophet and you're low priest, but Matt is high priest and kind of midway on the king. I am high priest. <laughs> yeah, priest. So it may be that you two guys together can really fulfill all three in that way. Yeah. You know, 
uh, you may do more of the, the vision casting, teaching, and things, and Matt is handling the administration, the counseling, but you may be helping doing some of that pastoral care yeah. as well. So it could be just two people. I, I would always recommend three, and it doesn't mean they have to be a pastor per se. It could just be one of your leaders is just really gifted at that, and they're willing to help you out like and, and come alongside. Huh? Kelly could be the, uh, the king. I think Kelly's probably the prophet, which she's just hiding back there. So. <laughs> All righty, so Kelly don't mean to pick on you. <laughs> now we got to see what she says. Um, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, I'm, I'm not actually joking. I actually have a real question, but I'm just ignoring your joking comment. <laughs> um, I, ha I was wondering, um, just a clarifying question. You said the prophet sees where the church needs to go, but the king sees how to get the church to where it needs to be. So is it basically like the prophet says, this is where we need to go, and then the king kind of shows how to get there. Exactly. So it's like a taxi driver. Exactly. Okay. Yep. I need to go to point A. You're taking me to point A. Right. Okay. Right. So the the king has that kind of strategy. They they see okay. Uh, so I'm high profit. So I, I I say okay. Five years. Here's what it's going to be. All right. But I have no clue how to get from A to Z. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what Z looks like. Mm -hmm. I know what Z looks like. Okay, I know what the end. I, know, I can see the end product in my head. I'm like, wait, so we have to start somewhere. Do I start with funds? Do I start with developing a team? Do I start with assessment? You know, which do I start yeah. with? Um, I have a friend, you know, Nathan Howard, yeah. he's at Bethany. When I was a youth pastor, uh, even even in youth ministry, I was high prophet. He was high king, and so I would have this crazy idea for a new ministry for the youth group. He would make it happen. And uh, you know, it's it's just it's kind of like in the the right now show. I had the idea with Mr. Phillips about you know a late night type talk show for the chapel, but Charles Schroff and Joe Bryant made it happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, they, they they function really well together uh, as a pair, um, and also remember the prophet's the one that makes sure that you're not abusing people on the way. They're seeing how to take care of people. Uh, so let's fly through these last few. We don't have to spend a lot of time. These are some very practical resources for you um, that you uh, you may do if you. Uh, when I was being assessed at our church, I had to do one of these, which was a great exercise. Uh, Strengths Finder. Uh, this is a, a book, and I've got the book uh, here. And if you buy the book, it comes with a code in the back. And you go online, and uh, I, I tore mine out, but you get a little scratch-off code. You go to their website, you take a, like a 20, 30-minute profile test, and it gives you your results. And uh, there are 34 different strengths. This is not, um, this was developed by a Christian, but not for churches. But it's been impl implemented by churches and other Christian organizations. But um, basically the idea was maximizing people's gifts and what they're really wired, their strengths in leadership, and maximizing those for, for better potential. So um, I'll just kind of give you a few. Uh, my uh, top five, usually when you do the test, to give you your top five. Mine is belief. Okay, so with belief, I have certain core values that are enduring. I'm family-oriented. Um, uh, what I value gives my life meaning uh, and satisfaction. Success is more than money and prestige. That kind of characterizes me a little bit. I, I have a very strong belief in gospel mission and, and, and making disciples, and I uh, believe my life should be spent doing that. Okay? My second strength uh, on the scale is connectedness. Um, I feel like I'm a part of something bigger, but I, I'm good at connecting with other people and getting to know them um, in order to help uh, lead them. My third is uh, responsibility. Um, I take psychological ownership for anything I commit to. That is very, very true, um, which means I'm not good at delegating. Um, it was very hard for me to let show do all the late night show stuff. There were several times I wanted to jump in, like, oh, let's do this. But it was one of those I just had to force myself. I said, you know what, I'm going to trust him. And the product was better than what I, what I would have uh, come up with. Um, let's see, my fourth one is includer. I like to bring people along with me. That's the mentoring idea. Um, I'm really big on uh, mentoring. I want people to feel part of the group. And uh, the last one of, of my gifts is ideation, which has more of a, um, I'm fascinated by ideas. So that's my, my futuristic thinking, my that apostolic type thing. So the idea of church planting and that sort of idea, it gets me going. Um, I think five years ahead, um, but not often, not often five minutes ahead. So um, Straight Five is a great tool. If you're going into church, uh, being assessed for church planting um, by many North American groups that do it, um, my church had me go through it as well. Uh, you actually have trained coaches who can uh, actually walk you through it, help you understand it. Oh, here's mine. Belief connected to this responsibility, includer ideation. Um, personality profiles, you've probably heard of the Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I took this a few years ago, 
And uh, so, you know, you have the extrovert, introvert type thing. Um, we don't have time to go into it. I can send you guys a link to where it's all described. But you guys can take their test. I did it as part of my church when I was a youth pastor. And um, uh, Aubrey Malfers, we mentioned him a while ago. He says in his book that when they were surveying uh, different church planners, like a thousand different church planners, this is back in the late 90s or so, that ENFP was the most common um, mix of church planters. They were extroverted. Um, that's one of the first part more than introverted. It doesn't mean there are any good introverted uh, church planners. It just means that more apostolic role is usually more extrovert. They're getting out in the open. They get energy from being around people. Um, here's the, the, the description of the ENFP type person. Warmly enthusiastic and imaginative. See life as full of possibilities. Make connections between events and information very quickly. Confidently proceed based on the patterns they see. Want a lot of affirmation from others and readily give appreciation and support. Spontaneous and flexible, often rely on their ability to improvise and their verbal fluency. Does that not sound like a church planter? That and they don't exactly like my life. And they didn't write this for Christians. This is a completely secular type idea that churches you know have used. Um, but when I read this, it kind of seems like this kind of you know characterizes many uh, guys. I would uh, you know guys I know. Yes, Kelly, go ahead. Oh, it sounds like you. There you go. Um, now, when I did the test, I am an ENTP. Uh, so instead of feeling, I'm a thinker instead of a feeler. But the feeler is more connected with people when I'm a little more of a thinker. Um, then the last is the personality profile, the DISC. I have not taken this, so I don't know a whole lot about it. But I did, I did find a good link uh, from a guy talking about church planters and the DISC profile. I'll put that on Blackboard to kind of supplement uh, for today to read through. But uh, Aubrey Malfers in his book and a few other uh, links I found did seem to say that a person with a high DNI seemed to function best as a church planter. Um, so I want to kind of show you some of those, uh, I guess, secular tools that actually I think are really helpful. The strength finders, this actually helped me understand myself a lot more, and it helped me realize why there are certain parts of my job here at Piedmont I struggle with and certain that I am really good at. I'm really, really good at networking with people, which has to do with my uh, connectedness. All right? But I'm really, really bad at organizing things like attendance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, really bad at that. But remember from the very first thing we said, what is a church planter? After all we've looked at, APES, prophet, priest, king, spiritual gifts, your disc profile, all that, more importantly, a Christian leader leads from character before skill. Character is far more important than skills in Christian leadership. All right? God can take a person who is not an ENFP, complete opposite in every sense, and they can be a fantastic church planter because it's God's Holy Spirit in you doing that, not your, your skills. But there are some very practical capabilities and skills that you know church planners have. So that concludes the lecture for today. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, get on the Blackboard um, and you know send me an email or anything. I'm gonna have some of these. I'm gonna have a few more articles that are going to add to the session nine uh, folder uh, and have for uh, have for you uh, for this week. So um, yes, Kelly, if you will just email it to me. Uh, that'd be great.